everybody, and welcome to our first episode of Act 3. You know, we've been working on this episode for darn near a year now, and of course, COVID-19 has made things very challenging for so many of us in our communities, in all of our communities. But the good news is, today's show is going to talk a little bit about dealing with some health concerns besides COVID-19 and just really evaluating the goodness that is around us. We've got a couple of special new features for the program in our brand new show. I can't wait to share them with you. Thanks for tuning in. Enjoy the program. Hi there, I'm Kevin Wagner and welcome to Act 3. I'm excited to be uh, here for first episode and I appreciate you joining us. I'm joined here today with Dave Hingley. Dave, thanks very much for joining us. Thanks Kevin, my pleasure. Um, and we're talking today, Dave, you had a, a diagnosis just a few years ago. Um, tell us a bit about uh, some of the health challenges you encountered here in recent years. Well, I, I was diagnosed with Parkinson's six years ago at a young age. Um, I won't say too, not too young, but <laughs> but uh, younger than most. Right. So uh, I've been, you know, trying to maintain a normal lifestyle as I possibly can with that. Well, and, and there's so many symptoms. I think we often think of Parkinson's as a, I think people associate it with the shakes that often occur with it. There's, you were telling me earlier, there's so much more that can come with it in terms of the, the symptoms. That's correct. Yeah, there's a laundry list of symptoms that you can get with Parkinson's and, um, you know, there's a lot of scary ones, which is the falling and the, you know, the shaking is the most visible one. Right. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the depression and the mental aspects, it's, it's a depletion of dopamine in your brain. Your body's not producing it anymore. So. And I imagine like you're in a, in a perfectly cognitive state of mind, but your body is just not behaving the way you, you know, are trying to control it. It's a it's a loss of control or I imagine it must feel like that in a sense. That's very true. You know, yeah. you're walking and it just doesn't do what you want it to do. Right. And it's a, it presents its own set of challenges. So yeah, sure. And balance being a big one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then certainly to, to combat that, they have all sorts of medications. I imagine depending what symptoms you are encountering. Right. Right. And they, um, they do treat the symptoms, um, on their own as well as, as for the Parkinson's, there's a, the main drug, which they have the levodopa carbidopa, which is the holy grail of the uh, medications, I suppose. Right. But um, there's a few others that they add on there as well, and they can present challenges on right. their own. Sure enough. And, and I suppose depending on what your symptoms are personally, but so you, you, you kind of get a, is it a complicated cocktail depending on the circumstances? Like, is it a challenging regime of, of medication? It can be, and, and mine was mine's quite simplified now. I was getting some side effects before from some of the sort of drugs that all, everybody reacts differently to different drugs. So right. I was having some uh, issues with some. And, um, you know, my neurologist working with him and he's streamlined things somewhat. And yeah. ho going forward, hopefully we can keep it under maintain it as well as we can into my older years. I, I suppose you're trying to find a balance to address the symptoms, but also to avoid some of the side effects that might be, you know, more concerning or even feel like it's not balancing out or maybe it's not doing what you would like it to be doing. Right, yes. And the, the levodopa carbidopa actually helps with your, your stride and your, you know, what's called freezing. So you have better movement. Right. Um, some of the other drugs, uh, you know, they'll stop the shaking. Um, I'm looking into certain ones for that now as well. So sure enough. And then like, like shaking aside, you, you mentioned that symptom again, a, probably a common one we associate it when we speak of Parkinson's, but just mobility in general, like how has it impacted some of the common day, daily things you, you, you love to do? We, we talked about sailing earlier. Yes. Uh, like, is that something you've had to step back from or? It, it is for the time being, yeah. um, you know, with the Parkinson's that has caused me to have a couple of falls, which got a couple of injuries. So. I backed off from the sailing racing side of things and but i do hope to get out in a boat again once i can get things sorted out so yeah, yeah. I, I suppose that compounds the challenge you have your body not necessarily 
reacting or acting the way you, you would like it to. You have medications you have to play with and there's certain aspects of your life you enjoy. There, it, it, it's kind of, does it feel like it's hitting you from all sides and, at some times, I wonder? Well, sort of does, you know, because I, I, I've got the arthritis as well. So it's a good combination package there. So uh, I guess uh, that, that's another thing. You had mentioned that uh, there's other health challenges we all experience as well. You happen to have arthritis combined with Parkinson's. It's yeah, a bit of a double whammy, I suppose. You got to keep smiling. Yeah, sure enough. It's a great, no, that's, uh, that's great advice. Keeping your chin up and keep smiling. That's so. right. Well, thanks again, Dave. I appreciate you taking the time to, to join us and share your story with us. Thanks for having me, Kevin. I'm, my pleasure. Once again, I'm Kevin Wagner. We've been talking with Dave Hinley and you've been watching Act 3. Thank you for joining us. Welcome to the first Wellness Minute. We are thrilled to introduce to you a new online local health and wellness resource called the Wellness Hub. It is available across Canada in your local communities. And in this Wellness Hub, you can find hundreds of listings of local businesses and service providers that provide health services, healthcare practitioners, you can find leisure activities, you can find listings of, of businesses that provide senior services. Um, as well as listing of events. Yeah, and health tips. There are many health tips, probably close to a thousand uh, health tips with just all kinds of great information. And of course, reviews too. People who have used local health uh, practitioners, local uh, products and services uh, have left reviews and you can uh, find people, probably someone who you actually know who has used one of the local uh, services. And that's the great thing about this being local. You find a health tip and you get interested in it and you can see, oh, this person is here, right here, where, where we live. I want to go and, and check out with them and, and, and get some more information. We're really glad to be able to bring this uh, uh, wellness hub to the local communities. And every, uh, every month we're going to be bringing you a new Wellness Minute. So please uh, join us again here on the Wellness Minute on Act 3. I am Alexis Taylor Middleton, your host for this wonderful interview with a Dr. Olena Gill, who is a naturopathic doctor with Indigo Medicine. And welcome, welcome today. How are you? Thank you for having me. This is wonderful. <laughs> I would love to share with our listeners, what is it that you do? Well, I'm so glad you asked, asked me that. <laughs> so, uh, yes, and that's true. Maybe some of your listeners aren't too familiar with what a naturopathic doctor does uh, or even heard of one. But let me give you a little bit of a background of naturopathic medicine. Um, it is, in fact, older in like the historic, like the timeline of, you know, of history. It's actually older than what we now call mainstream medicine. And uh, it's really a combination uh, kind of coming forward in time, it's really a combination of what you'd call ancestral um, medicine or, you know, ways of approaching health issues combined with a modern medical system. And that in, in a nutshell is what naturopathic medicine is. But I would say the, you know, like the basic tenets of naturopathic, it, it's really about disease prevention, I would say if, if, if I were to put, you know, a couple of words on it as, as a core tenant, it would be about preventing disease. Um, and, and th that is in fact, the, the mainstay of my practice. Um, you know, people often will come to me, not saying that there's, there, there aren't issues, uh, but they will often come with the mindset around, you know, what can I do to prevent something from happening right down the road, you know, or my family has, these, let's say diseases, you know, issues like high blood pressure or diabetes or things like that. I'd like to make sure that I don't get there. So what can I do to get, you know, make sure that doesn't yes. happen. So it's that forward, you know, mindset. Um, but yet at the same time, naturopathic uh, also differs from the, the mainstream medicine by looking at, at it from the individual lens. Um, and it's the idea that we're all unique. You know, there may be for example, like diabetes. Okay. So there's diabetes, but in fact, you'll have, you know, a thousand people showing it and expressing yes. it in different ways and behaving in different ways. And so treating it cannot be like a cookie cutter approach. No. And so naturopathic medicine looks at it from the individual. That's the 
that's the big characteristic of naturopathic. Um, so it's customized. And so when we kind of fast forward to, you know, treatment approaches, let's say, we look at, you know, what you, the individual present, we don't, we, we just don't look at, well, what's the disease or the health issue or the health concern that you present with, we look at, okay, what are all the all the aspects of you that makes you unique, and let's approach it from, from, from that way and, and customize treatment accordingly. What is it that you're finding your patients are coming to you most for and how are they benefiting? Would you be talking about, let's say during 2020, like during the pandemic? Yes, during this pandemic, absolutely. Okay. Well, I would say, yeah, once we, we were able to get back to, uh, to work uh, in, in an in-office setting, um, I heard many people, this was a common theme that I heard of, um, among many people, is how they were dealing with a lot more like mental health uh, issues. And so certainly I would say the pandemic highlighted that. I saw a lot more uh, cases um, of, you know, anxiety, uh, depression, um, you know, also frustration, you know. Um, I heard the words, you know, helpless, hopeless, you know, a lot, a lot of those were scattered. So I definitely would say in 2020, I, I heard and saw a lot more of that than I probably ever had had to date. What approaches do you, uh, is it that you're, you're offering as a naturopathic physician that would well, help with those? Good question. That's a good question. Um, and naturopathic medicine certainly utilizes a lot of we call natural medicines as well. So in other words, non-pharmaceutical approaches, that doesn't mean we don't embrace pharmaceuticals. We, cause we do, we, we accept that also as part of the medical model as well. However, um, there are a lot of, you know, these non-pharmaceutical approaches that we can, can look at such as, you know, botanicals, for example, herbal medicine. Uh, in my practice, I do a lot of herbal medicine uh, prescriptions and I customize a lot of, um, you know, like tinctures, for example, uh, or herbal, uh, herbal teas for, for people. Uh, again, individualized to the issue that they, you know, present with, of course. Do acupuncture, I'm an acupuncturist as well. So I've, I've done a lot of acupuncture in 2020. <laughs> uh, that's for sure. So uh, yes, I've needled a lot of people. Uh, so that's, that's another stream. Uh, also that falls under the banner of naturopathic as well. Uh, and that is certainly one of my strengths. Uh, and I'm also licensed in it as well. So, uh, so I do treat a lot with acupuncture. Um, but I would certainly say, you know, I, we look at diet, we look at lifestyle counseling. There's been a lot of counseling uh, interspersed in, in my sessions in 2020, you know, around uh, just the concerns and the feelings that people have, have expressed. Uh, you know, with this pandemic. So, you know, we do dietary, we look at dietary changes, we look at, uh, you know, what kinds of things can you shift in your lifestyle, you know, to help improve what it is that they're going through or, or perhaps prevent. I do a lot of stress management, you know, bringing in um, what I call mind body techniques. Mm -hmm. You know, one of one of my passions, I would say as, as a not, not just as a doctor, but just in my own mindset as general, one of my passions is looking at through the lens of the, that mind body connection, you know, how, how are we thinking about things and how our thoughts and views and, you know, all of that contribute to how we are feeling, you know, or how our bodies are feeling and behaving. I would love to know what is the greatest joy that you have as a naturopathic doctor? Oh, wow. Well, that's a deep question. <laughs> I would say my, well, joy is definitely one way I would describe it, but I would say more, it's a sweet spot. Okay. My sweet spot is when I can really make a connection with somebody on a really deep level. So it's, in other words, it's really hearing often what they're also not saying Yes. As opposed to what they are saying, mm -hmm. right? They may come in with one layer of a symptom that says, here's X, Y, Z. But in reality, underneath, 
there's all these other <laughs> layers <laughs> ways that aren't being expressed. And so when I make that connection on that level, um, that brings me to that place of joy. That's yeah. beautiful. Yeah. And in, and, and I so appreciate the time that you're, you're taking to come and share with everyone all about what naturopathic medicine is and how it can be of support during this uh, time of stress for many people and time of great change. And what would you offer for individuals who are uh, having to make travels to and from hospitals and to and from doctor's offices? What would you suggest in terms of self-care? Because I know that there's a lot of uncomfortableness uh, and resistance for some people who don't want to leave their homes, understandably, and aren't necessarily able to leave their homes to receive the care that they need. Mm -hmm. Well, what uh, definitely the pandemic uh, has allowed um, is telemedicine. So that's, that's the first thing. Prior to that, it was really only seen as a novel, novel thing. Um, but of course, you know, once once we shut down last March, uh, it quickly, quickly became apparent um, that you know healthcare doesn't stop, obviously, no. and we needed to have you know better infrastructure to be able to facilitate healthcare. And so telemedicine actually stepped in very quickly. Um, and got underway. So in fact, I was able to still see patients, um, you know, through my, <laughs> through my computer <laughs> yeah. uh, and still do in fact. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so that, I think that's, that's the first thing is that now that is available. And so people are able um, to, to connect through their computers. They don't have to leave their homes. Um, and I've had not just those who haven't been able to leave, but I've had patients who let's say are, you know, they're busy, busy moms, or, uh, you know, they've have their house full with kids or, you know, there's all these situations, yes. right. Um, and so they've utilized uh, telemedicine. Uh, but in terms of also self care, uh, you know, really basic things, basic things is even just you know, can, if, if somebody can even go for a walk, even, even around their block uh, or in their immediate area, obviously, you know, with masks on, you know, during this time, but nevertheless, it's like to just get out as much as you can within your immediate radius, connect with nature. Um, you know, my office, one of my offices, I should say, is close to a, to a forest. <laughs> uh, so often I've actually prescribed, believe it or not, uh, nature therapy. I've actually literally told people, you know, your prescription is to go for a walk in the woods. That's fantastic. So we can connect with, with yes. you know, uh, with the trees uh, and kind of the world at large without, mm -hmm. uh, without, of course, in this case, having to be, you know, close to people physically. But, it's, uh, but I value uh, very much that you have such a broad perspective and in, in terms of health and wellness. And that is, it's, it's such a gift that you're offering everyone to look at things in a little, little broader perspective. And I find that's off that that's just fantastic. And it's often what is lacking is having another, another way of looking at things in terms of health. So I thank you so much, Dr. Olena Gill, for your time and for sharing with everyone um, the importance of naturopathic medicine and ways that it can help people during this time. Good. Well, thank you. I'm happy to be on. That's wonderful. Take care. With us now is Mr. Dan Elliott. He's an absolutely famous artist in our community, and we are blessed to have him on the show. Welcome to the program, Dan. How are you? I'm good, thank you very much. And I'm just going to take this off so we can talk, and we're good here. And we are. Yes. Um, my name is Dan Elliott. I'm Savannah's First Nations, and I'm happy to live and play on the Sanamo First Nations territory. They're honorable, and I love the people here. And I think it's important for us to acknowledge uh, and it's part of the Truth and Reconciliation. It's part of can Canada's commitment to show acknowledgments across the country uh, and show respect, and that builds uh, relationships. 
Absolutely. So I'm happy to be here. And and thank you for coming. We're so happy to have you. Yeah. Dan, it, this is going to be a regular segment on Act 3. We're calling it Raven Tales. So we're very excited mm -hmm. to be able to have a first glimpse of what Raven Tales is going to look like. So why don't you share what you do best, which is not only be a fabulous human, but also an incredible artist. So tell us a little bit about this painting behind us. Well, this painting comes from a, a black and white photograph I got from our community in Staminas, and it is just south of Yellow Point, British Columbia, and it's a place called Cleet Bay. And and this photograph uh, has since the, the building, these are called longhouses, and has been moved actually across this area here. So I, I seen this Japanese woodblock print, it was just a tiny one. And, and then I seen a picture of some snow and I thought, how cool would it be to kind of incorporate that kind of thinking? So I have the, the kind of dark, like a black print. And so I was, I decided to paint, um, around 1990, I started to paint parts of uh, my culture mm -hmm. and introduce indigenous culture and art. And, and so, so this painting here is around the feeling of uh, maybe what a pre-colonial uh, lifestyle would look like. And so we've got our transport canoes and winter dancing and feasting that happens in here. And we've had that uh, a few years ago and, and a little bit this year where we had some snow right down on the beach in Cleet Bay. And it's just kind of uh, east of Ladysmith, um, B.C. And uh, so I, I wanted to have this feeling like you're peeking into some of the past. No matter what I've done in my life, I've been uh, a commercial fisher for 25 years. I've been a counselor. Uh, I've coached. I've, but I've always been an artist. Yes. Ever since I was a little kid. And uh, in 1983, I, through the advice of my uh, art professor, to try watercolors. And so since 1983, so it's 37 years I've been doing watercolors and I've challenged myself of getting slightly bigger and bigger and anybody who knows watercolors. Yes. Difficult. So Very. I, I challenge yeah. myself with the big ones. So I've done some stuff around pre-contact uh, First Nations history and, and, uh, and it was a really important piece and people love it. It has a very peaceful kind of feel to the mm. snow and, and the celebration of just being together in a longhouse and not worrying about having to go outside and you're eating and feasting and yeah so it was a uh, so this one is just called uh, snow and cleats bay and uh it's um i have an elder that actually uh danced in this one and he was one of my teachers uh bill seward of sanamo first nations fantastic and he says yeah i danced in this one here oh so this that is was, great that was pretty cool well we have another painting to take a look at we do so let's uh let's take a good look at another Another part of your character, which we're really excited to share. I love this painting. Yeah. This is one of my favorites and it has mm -hmm. been for a very long time. It really does remind me of you. I, I remember us doing something with these paddles mm -hmm. quite some time ago at, at one of the functions that we shared. Right. Tell us about this painting and what inspired you. Well, this one was kind of a, an, an introduction for some of the cultural pieces of my culture and some of it was like this mysterious mystical kind of and I was trying to find a way to connect with with that because as you may know I grew up away from my culture yeah so I came to uh, to understand this later in my life and so part of uh, I did a painting called winter fire different than this one but it was my question for myself about my uh, who am I as an Indigenous person. And it was the first one where I did longhouses and anything to do with First Nations. So that was kind of a precursor for my questions around uh, how I'm going to include my artwork uh, and my Indigenous heritage. So I took uh, some amazing, lucky, fabulous lessons that were a European watercolor professor retired at Anaimo, Michael B. Gergay. And I met him at 14. And so I have this European strong, disciplined, fine arts background and I mixed it with my indigenous art. So it's very different for people to go, um, wow, it's this, this is, so this one for me was, I basically painted it with a one inch uh, sable brush and 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 I just kind of allowed the paint to fall because I have a lot of control over my watercolors, which yeah. taken a long time to develop. Yeah. But this one I let flow, 
and I just allowed uh, the process to happen. I'd use no frisket, which is a, a, a blocks out the paint so I can have, add color later. I did everything except for his eyes. Mm. And, and I really wanted to focus on the eyes and they are quite piercing. They are. And I used to ask kids, uh, what, what emotion is this fellow feeling or uh, projecting? Is he happy? Is he sad? And it's like, and you can't really put a finger on it because he doesn't look mad. He doesn't look really mean, but it's certainly intimidating. But, but he also looks very curious, right? Oh, yeah. And That's that where I'm a... getting. It's like he's got a curious sense and a sense of, you know, at, at times, depending on what's going on, you know, this is a really rough time for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. With COVID-19, there's a lot of sadness. Yeah. So if people have felt loss, mm -hmm. I can see the loss that is here. Yeah. But I can also see the curiosity, the joy, the mm -hmm. the how you know a person can can be surrounded by the beauty of nature and yeah. just to try to figure it all out. So, you know, I can see where where yeah. this painting has got so much diversity <clears throat> with it at any time and at any stage. I mean, you certainly didn't paint this during COVID. This is like no. back in two thousand and seven. Two thousand seven. Yeah. There's something I wanted to bring forward, and that's how Indigenous people historically used to see each other is I wouldn't be smiling all the time necessarily or I wouldn't be sad or frowning I'm just like I see you yeah but I see all of you I see your spirit I see your emotion yeah. I see your mental I see the whole person and right now I'm not passing any judgment I'm just see you and that's what this guy's doing yeah so it's a way for those that come after me to go oh that's how indigenous people kind of learned how to see mm. I see you so I had permission from the late Bill Seward and my late uncle Ray Peter. I show them they're both spirit dancer. Um, they had spirit dancers and and uh, they looked at it for a long time and are like, you know what? It's time. Mm -hmm. It's time for this to be seen. Yeah. So I was thinking I was going to have to just crumple this up and burn it. That's what I thought. I thought if they if they rejected it and said no, you can't show this. Wow. I thought it was going to have to disappear. <laughs> well, thank goodness we didn't yeah. have to have it crumpled up. There's more to show. There is more to show. I'm getting excited. I'm always excited, but yeah. this is very, very cool. So a minute ago, we were looking at two other paintings that mm. have been extraordinary. And I said that I thought that they were kind of my favorites. <laughs> I think I've got another one. <laughs> okay. Tell us about this painting and the significance behind it. Yeah, this was kind of a big turning point for me. Yeah. Because I'm painting these really beautiful pictures of historical pieces. Yes. And people were enjoying them and it's lovely. But it wasn't a reflection of what I've seen happening with how Indigenous people are and are treated and through every level of government and church. And so I'm a part of that. And so I've seen an untruth, if you will. And I thought, you guys, you know, I, I, I appreciate the beautiful carvings. I appreciate the wonderful graphics, the art, but man, there's a story going on yeah. and we're missing it. So this one was, I put this one down as, as you know, talking to one of my elders and his name was Stephen David from Sinemo First Nations. And he said, um, I feel like I'm transparent in this world. So when I go to Vancouver, I feel like I'm invisible and people bump into me or they don't care. I have to walk around them. And so this kind of, longing for what's really going on um, came out in this piece yeah. and this was a really a sketch it's just a watercolor sketch but it's like this guy's got no head and he doesn't even know where he's going or what he's doing and and all these people are so focused on themselves and this is kind of a reflection of how society is and so our elders and, and even not just first nation our elders become transparent yeah all of them and, and it's like a saddest yeah. thing because they're a wealth of knowledge and wisdom. We can access that, but they become silent because there's no respect there. There's nobody uh, reaching at them or uh, for them in a, in a good way. So this was um, an echo of a series that I started and, um, and I called it the winds of change. So the winds of change has become a life of its very own. You it know, has become a, a, a life number of, its own. of paintings. Mm -hmm. Why don't you share a little bit about the, because this is the opening piece of a life of its yeah. own, right? Or uh, sorry, not a life it of is, its own, it but is. it is a life of its own. It, and and this one change. was, I was finally addressing what I knew to be true. Yeah. 
yeah. you know, my work in corrections and with Aboriginal youth in the school systems, with our seniors in our community, I was feeling that uh, there's something really big missing. And beautiful words, there's libraries full of beautifully written words about events and what's happened around the truth and the reconciliation, but there's not a lot of pictures. So my job as an artist was I just became in favor to paint this series. But then you didn't just get in favor to do it. You were commissioned to do it. Is that not right? No, I, 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 I actually received a grant. I just put a proposal into the First People's Cultural Society to allow me to paint, uh, to buy supplies and uh, to paint a body of work. And as long as I include their name, they said, you do what you need to do with it. So it's beautiful. It's, it's a wonderful such way. A gift. Of, yeah. So I, I feel so blessed because if I didn't have that, I couldn't have done what I've done. Even it would be just sitting in the recesses of my mind. Yeah. So, but it's not. It's all yeah, out there for it is. us to share. And as it is out there for us to share, yeah. you know, this is the first of the pieces. But then you started off with just a little... <laughs> drawing i'm just going to pass that to yeah. you as we begin you know that next adventure into mm -hmm. another of the series yeah, another of the series tell us about this sketch so i drew this sketch in 2006 and as a kid growing up on these little trollers and being a part of the marine life and industry shell fishing and i'd always play with these bulb kelps and we cut faces in them because it was fast and it was easy and I thought, you know, I bet you a grandparent or a parent would quickly do a doll up for a little girl yes. to go play. Yes. So I called this one the kelp doll. And you know, when I looked and I looked for uh, the right model. Yeah. And so this is 2006. 13 years later, my granddaughter was old enough to be this child. So this is what has become of it. I'm this, going to pass this over to this you. This is my idea. And I'm going to trade you. Oh, there. Perfect. And I'll leave you to describe yeah. this body. I'm just going to set this right Sure. Here. Perfect. So this is um, my granddaughter, Sophia. And um, what an honor to paint this. This is part of the series. And this is the, the juicy, wonderful bits that get you through the show. Because I go from what was beautiful, what was the interruption with indigenous people and how can we conciliate. So this is a little bit about that for me. So this is uh, the good part. This is the juicy bits. This gives you the breath of air. Yes. Uh, that. So I, I, I took some photos, I did some sketches of Sophia and um, and I started painting it. I had a friend commission to do the hat and, and the cedar hat is just, it's uh, beautiful and I loved it. So I did this one in um, April, 2020. So right in the middle of when COVID was hitting us hardest in Canada here. So, uh, so through all of that, I was still working in, in art here. Yeah. And um, so I had, uh, I wouldn't let Sophia uh, see the picture. She come running down the hall. I said, Sophia, it's ready. She come running and she skid and fell on her backside like she's seen a ghost. And, <laughs> but she's seen herself. Wow. And, and she, it was so overwhelming. She just had no words. Wow. So it is a very good likeness of her. But what came to me after I finished this piece was, okay, this was 2020. And I said, honey, what were you thinking of? And she said, COVID-19. <laughs> and I just about Aww. cried, you know. She's, so she had this concern yes. on her face about when I'm painting her. And what came to me is that how children felt 200 years ago. What is colonization? I, I, it's coming. It's all around us. And I don't know what to do about it. Yeah. So that look probably was on the children's faces the same. Yeah. So she's she's part of both. It's incredible. I, I noticed you, you have a ability to bring out emotion in the eyes so well, so beautifully. And again, I just reminding our audience that this is in a series of how many? 12? 13? 13. 13. And I call it 13 plus 1, and you'll know why I'll... It'll come out later, but... Well, have people stay tuned. Yes, 13 <laughs> plus 1. And one of my elders wrote a poem called, guess what? 13 plus 1? 13 plus 1. Wonderful. She's been helping me through this whole yeah. thing, every painting. Yeah. Helping me, keeping my feet on the ground while I do this work. 
Well, it's in, it's inspiring work, and I can't wait for our community yeah. to have a really good opportunity to see it in show. I know that it's coming to show. Do you have any details that you're able to share about that right now, or should we just tell people to? Well, we're working on a a, a, a showing at VIU, and it may be in the fall. We don't know yet. You know, COVID is playing so many it's, tricks. It really is. Yeah. That's another Raven's Tale is what's going on around that. <laughs> well, the good news is, yeah. is Raven's Tale on Act 3 is coming soon. And your mm -hmm. host will be Dan Elliott. Dan, thanks for being with us today. I am so honored. Giving us a glimpse of what yeah. we can expect in the future. And thank, thank you. you so much for your beautiful art. We are a better community oh, by having you in Thank it. you. I'm going to give you a high five. High five, baby. <laughs>
and there'll be information about that, I guess, later in the programming. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, we have a Facebook page. Uh, Elder Dog is actually a national organization. They have chapters in eight different provinces, including BC. Okay. And so Elder Dog, if you Google Elder Dog Canada, you'll come to the national website. But if you want more local, we have a Facebook site, or you can just call us directly and speak to someone about either if you want to volunteer in helping the seniors, or if you're a senior who wants to inquire about getting some assistance. That's great. Do you have a large number of volunteers here in uh, Nanaimo? Right now we've got uh, over 35 volunteers. I don't know the exact figure because it changes every week. Uh, people have to go through the process of applying and getting criminal records checked. Right. Uh, but we've got a good solid body of volunteers right now who are involved in everything from rehoming to fostering to dog walking. Uh, it's just a great group of people who have come together so over nice. this. And you are across the island, right? Across the island as well as... Uh... We will t accept calls from anywhere on the island. Perfect. There is a pod in Victoria. There's a pod that's just starting up now in Comox Courtney area. Nice. The Nanaimo area, we have seniors from Parksville who were, were servicing with people who live either in Parksville, volunteers or in the North End. Uh, our goal is to cover the whole island. Well, that's wonderful. Well, Sharon, thank you so much for appearing with us and talking about Elder Dog Canada. We're so happy to have this wonderful service. Well, it's a privilege to be here and thank you so much for having me. You're very welcome. Well, that does it for our first episode of Act 3. And we can't wait to bring you some more episodes. You know, right now we have to be extra vigilant and diligent and careful in every way we possibly can be to look after each other during COVID-19. Some people are autoimmune deficient. I'm one of those people that if I get sick, I really know that I've gotten sick and there are a lot of people in our community that are struggling with issues related to diabetes and heart disease, related to you know other things you can't see in our bodies. We have to be really careful of those people. So let's look after each other. It's really easy to do it. All we have to do is remember to wash our hands all the time. Remain socially distant wherever you can. And of course, don't forget to put on your mask the more fashionable, the more fashionable, the better. And enjoy. Thanks again for tuning in. We'll see you next time on Act 3. I'm feeling wonderful. Oh, it's a